Welcome everybody to the 8th video lecture in discrete mathematics. So today we will be continuing our study in the proof techniques and in particular in the constructive proofs and we will be looking at the case study proofs. So to recall, so we want to prove a statement B from statement A and there are various proof techniques that can be applied namely constructive proof, proof by contradiction, proof by contrapositive induction, counterexample and existential proof. We will be looking at these various proofs one by one. Currently we are looking at the constructive proofs. This problem comes again and again to your mind and hence I will repeat it every video talk, video lecture where we talk about uh, this proof techniques, namely which of this approach to apply. And let me tell it once again that it depends on the problem which some for some problems you might be able to apply a particular technique and for some problems some other technique some problems can be split into smaller problems that can be handled easily while some problems can be viewed in a completely different way which can help us in understanding the problem easier but whether to split a problem or not and how to split a problem and how to look at a problem this is an art in itself and that has to be developed by you. There are some thumb rules that we can provide you. We will be teaching you the various techniques and telling you the thumb rule but at the end of the day it is you who have to develop the skill of understanding which problem will require which application. And that can be achieved only by a lot of practice. Now till now we have seen things like how to split a problem into two smaller parts if the deduction that we make is an AND. That means if we have to prove A implies B and B can be written as C and D then A implies B is basically same as saying A implies C and A implies D. So we saw this example which, which uh, was saying that if B is an odd prime then 2B square is greater than or equal to B plus 1 whole square and B square is congruent to 1 mod 4 and applying this particular splitting this problem into two parts depending on the deduction we could split it up into two parts namely first part if b is an odd prime then b square is congruent to 1 mod 4 and the second part if b is an odd prime then 2b square is greater than or equal to b plus 1 whole square. Now moving on we also saw that there can be redundant assumptions Namely, there can be some assumptions that are not necessary. That hang, keeping those assumptions can only make the problem more confusing and complicated. So, if we can throw them away, it would be a big advantage for us. For example, if we can prove A Im implies B and the assumption says that you can assume A and C, then clearly this assumption C is a redundant assumption. So basically the idea is that if A implies B then A and C also implies B. So if the original problem was actually A and C implies B then you can safely throw away C and solve the problem of A implies B. That might help you to simplify the problem, make your understanding clearer and it will be a useful thing to do. Now, which assumptions that are, are needed and which assumptions are not needed, which assumptions to be thrown and so on, all depends upon your intelligence. In the sense that your experience and intelligence will tell us which one will be required and which one will not be required. So we saw the, the application of this particular thing in our problems, namely we had these two problems, part A and part B, and we applied this both of them into this 
uh, this particular return, uh, removing of redundancies in assumption. In particular, we looked at wh what property of the odd prime, given the fact that B is an odd prime, what property of the odd prime do we need in either of the cases? And what we realized is that in the first case, all we need is that B is an odd integer, and second case, all we need is that B is a real number greater than or equal to 3. This is a typical example of problems where redundancies in the assumptions are not required. Now, we continued from here and solved these two problems using direct proof. So, we use direct proof, which is a special case of the constructive proof. And as I told you earlier, constructive proofs have two parts. Part A is what we call as direct proof. That means you directly prove A to B. Or in other words, you message A to get B. The second one is case studies. And I will come back to this one particularly in the end of this video lecture. So we have we had used this direct proof for proving our two problems. So we gave you two problems, namely uh, two problems and two different approaches. The first approach was okay, work with A, keep on working with A, and whatever uh, else is known to you, and you can output B by you can uh, deduce B by doing a step-by-step -step deduction. The other option is going in the backward direction. It is because sometimes direct proof can be a bit magical and confusing. We have seen this particular example earlier in the earlier video where a direct proof is not very clear how to obtain a direct proof. So in that case, we would like to use a backward proof. Now, what is the backward proof? The backward proof is nothing but you start working your way through B. In other words, to prove A implies B, the idea is to simplify B. Can we say, okay, we have to prove A implies B. Now, what does B mean? And let's keep on simplifying this problem. And basically, it turns out that if you can finally prove that B and C are same. In that case, A implies B is of course same as saying A implies C. And now that you have simplified C, it might help you to understand or get a full proof of A implies B uh, C directly. So that is the idea of the direct proof. Either you go forward or go backward. So this is what we did till last video. Now in this video, let's start with one more special case that can arise. Namely, sometimes proving something that is stronger can be easier. Now what do we mean by that? Say we want to prove A implies B. But I know that C implies B. So if I can prove A implies C, then I may be able to prove, sorry, if I can prove A implies C, then immediately it will imply A implies B. Now the catch is that <coughs> C can be a much stronger statement than B. It's possible that C is much stronger. So you might not be able to prove A implies C. So I am actually asking you to prove a harder statement to obtain A implies B. But that's what happens sometimes. Namely sometimes we do come across problems where proving something harder can actually be easier. So let's look at this one example. So here is an example. It says that if B is a real number and B is greater than or equal to 2, then 2B square cube is strictly greater than 3B plus 2. Now, how to prove this number? Let's see. 
So, first of all, we know that B is greater than or equal to 2. That means B cube is greater than or equal to B square. This only follows from the fact that B is greater than or equal to 1 actually. And now, since this is true, therefore, 2B cube So, uh, to prove 2B cube is bigger than or equal to 3B plus 2, this is what we have to prove. To prove this line, it's, this line, it follows from the fact that if we can prove 2B square is greater than or equal to 3B plus 2. Now, note here that this statement that 2B cube square is bigger than or equal to 3b plus 2 is actually a harder statement to prove. But we are saying that okay, if we can prove that harder statement, then the previous statement, which is what we want, will follow. So the implication here in the, is not if and only if, uh, unlike what we saw in the last case where we were removing assumptions, but here we are making the problem or the, our goal harder and harder. Now to prove 2b square is greater than or equal to 3b plus 2, this is same as of course b square plus, now I have just basically taken the b in the other side, so b square plus b square minus b is greater than or equal to 2b plus 2. Now once again. Note that this b square minus b is greater than 0. Why? Again, by the same logic that since b is greater than 2, so b square is greater than b. So b square minus b is greater than 0. That means I can remove this positive term on the, on the right hand side. Sorry, on the left hand side. In other words, I am saying that remove a positive term and still can you prove this statement. b square is greater than or equal to 2b plus 2. Again, note that this line is actually a harder line to prove than the previous line. But the reason I'm doing it is that this line now, as you can see, looks much more tractable. It doesn't have a cubic expression and it's pretty neat at this point. And as you can kind of guess here, that this is doable in the other words so this follows from the fact that b minus 1 whole square is greater than or equal to 1 from which it follows that this follows from the fact that if b is greater than or equal to 2 we have the result right so in other words we could go in the we could go in the backward direction or not backward direction rather we could simply make our problems harder and harder and harder and yet at the end we could get a solution the reason is that once we made the expression doable it was easier for us to prove although the problem as such became harder so the trick here is that <laughs> there are hard problems or harder problems and then there are problems which you can solve. Sometimes solving a harder problem can be easier and hence converting a simpler problem to a harder problem can mean the actual trick. Right? Okay, so moving on, so the technique so far that we have seen till now is that to prove A implies B, we can either split up the problem into two smaller parts depending on whether B can be split up as C and D. We can see that um, if we can reduce the, reduce B, 
or not reduce we can find out a c which is same as b then proving a implies p is same as proving a implies c we also prove that if c implies b and we can imply we can prove a implies c then this is enough to prove a implies b that means making it harder can be actually easier sometimes So this is the kind of the technique that we have learned so far. Now in the rest of the video, I will be going into a new way of splitting the problem. This is depends on splitting it according to the assumptions. So in other words, sometimes the assumptions can be split into different cases. And in that case, we will be able to split it up into smaller problems. For example, again, if we have to prove A implies B, and A is C or D, then A implies B is same as saying C implies B and D implies B. Please prove it for yourself that this statement is indeed correct. Use the propositional logic technique that we have done to check that this is indeed correct. So for example, let's start with this example that we have here. If A and B are two positive integers, then prove that A square minus 4B cannot be equal to 2. How do you split this problem? First of all, we have to understand what is the A and what are the B. Now, what is the A here? The A or the set of assumptions is A and B are two positive integers. Okay. There is doesn't seem to be a very natural way of splitting it up, or is it? Okay, we will see. And what is the deduction? Deduction is that a square minus 4b cannot be equal to 2. Now, this is what we do. Okay, so this is another way of stating it. That is, this problem is says that a square is not congruent to 2 mod 4. Recall your number theory notations that if I say that a square minus 4b cannot be equal to 2 which means that a square minus 2 is not divisible by 4 or a square is not congruent to 2 mod 4. Now to start with the proof as I told you I would like to split the assumptions into cases. Now this is the first of your kind maybe you are seeing and therefore I am going to do it fully here. I will give you a few set of problems on this line that you will be asked to solve for your exercise. I will of course, you will also of course get an assignment at the end of this week which will include all these kind of proper uh, questions on this subject. So one way of splitting it up is that what are, so if A is a positive integer and if divide by 4, what are the possible remainders? Now the possible remainders are of course 0, 1, 2 and 3, right? So if I have to prove this particular statement that is, if, which is basically means that A square is not congruent to 2 mod 4, then it is same as we can solve it by case by case basis. Or in other words, we can say that, okay, let A be a, let A be the integer that is divisible by 4, or which means that the remainder is 0. Then can I prove it? Secondly, second case will be if, if A, when divided by 4, has remainder 1, can I prove it? That will be second case. Third case and fourth case similarly for remainder 2 and 3. 
So that is basically the plan. So we split the problem into four cases depending on the remainder when A is divided by 4. So the cases are, as I told you, case 1, case 2, case 3 and case 4 depending on the remainders of 0, 1, 2 and 3. Now when we have this, we can do a case by case basis. So we can take the case 1 and solve it. So let's start with it. So the case 1, we know that the remainder when divide, divided, when A is divided by 4, it has remainder 0. Or in other case, A is equals to 4R for some positive integer R. Now let's see in that case, can you prove something that S square is congruent, not congruent to 2 mod 4? Possibly, let's see. So S square is equals to 16 R square just by squaring it. And therefore, if I take any 4B, so S square minus 4B is 16 R square minus 4B, which is 4 R square minus B. Now, since 4 R square minus B is an integer and 4 times an integer can never be equal to 2, therefore 4 into 4 R square minus B can never be 2. Or in other words, S square minus 4 B cannot be, cannot equal to 2 in this particular case. So this proves us that if A is divisible by 4 or if A has remained as 0 when divided by 4, then we prove that A square minus 4B cannot be equal to 2. Now you can, you don't need to look at the rest of the video at all. You can just try to solve you, your problem by you can solve the other cases other three cases by yourself for example for the case of case 2 that is when the remainder is 1 then what can we say again we can say that a is equals to 4 r plus 1 for some positive integer r again let's do it what is a square a square is 16 r square plus 8 r plus 1. So s square minus 4 b will be 4 times 4 r square plus 2 r minus b plus 1. Now you can already see that this is a 4 times a number plus 1. So this is an odd number. This is not an even number because 4 times a number is an even number plus 1 which is an odd number. Thus this number just can now never be 2. The same way of saying is that that 4 times this number can never be 1. And so we have that s square minus 4b cannot be equal to 1 even in this case. Let's go to the case 3. In the case of case 3, the same thing, we start for the case where A is, A has remainder 2 when divisible by 4. In that case, A is equals to 4R plus 2 for some positive integer R. And now if we multiply square it up, we get some 16R square plus 16R plus 2 actually yeah, that's right. I've done it right. And now, if I do this, a square minus 4b, this is 4 times 4r square plus 4r plus 1 minus b, which is again, if you realize, same thing as the first case where it is 4 times an integer and hence cannot be equal to 2. Right? So this is again a 4 times integer and hence cannot be equal to 2. And now this brings us to the last case, which is the case where the remainder is 3. 
again here a is equals to 4r plus 3 so a square is 16r square plus 24r plus 9 now here if I subtract it you have to break this 9 as 8 plus 1 and then you realize that this is 4 times 4r square plus 6r plus 2 minus b plus 1 again it is a 4 times a number integer plus 1 and hence this cannot be equal to 2. Thus we have broken up into 4 cases and for each of the cases we have proved that the statement a square minus 4b cannot be equal to 2. So this con concludes the whole proof. So to complete the proof we, we first ensure that we split up the assumption into four cases. Now this is something very important. We have to ensure that these four cases are the only cases. Can there be any other cases? No. In this case it is very easy to convince that there is no other case. So in other words if a is a positive integer then when it is divisible by 4 the only remainders left are 0, 1, 2 or 3. Thus we have exhausted all the cases. This is a very important thing to check always in case studies whether all the cases has been considered. And then we solve the problem in a case by case basis. Right? And we prove that for each of the cases it cannot be equal to so this is a typical case study problem where we split the assumptions or split the problem depending on the assumptions. We will see more of this particular technique in the next video also. Okay. So this brings us to the end of this video lecture. Thank you.